Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. We are going to go back to Revelation. And we'll be bouncing back and forth through Revelation, starting in 12, chapter 12, and going through the book of Revelation to gain insight. Now, to repeat, I like to repeat this over and over again. The book of Revelation is all about the tribulation period. And the tribulation period is all about the world. According to Isaiah, the day of the Lord, that is the tribulation period, is for the purpose of bringing to an end wickedness and the wicked ones. It is also for the purpose of bringing forth a worldwide revival. I should stop there for just a moment because I find that when I'm debating post-tribulationists, that is, people who believe that the church will go through the tribulation, one of the reasons they believe the church is going through the tribulation is that they believe the church will be the agency that brings people to Christ during the tribulation. If the church was gone, there would be no one to witness for Christ, and therefore the church can't be gone before the tribulation. And Well, as we have seen in Revelation 7 in particular, God is raising up a whole new group of evangelists after the church departs, and they will preach the gospel of the kingdom in a way more effective than it has ever been preached in the history of the church since Jesus was resurrected. So there's going to be a worldwide revival during the tribulation, and it'll be a revival that's successful in one way, and that is people will be undergoing such anguish that they will be looking for answers. And when the first person comes along with the gospel, they're going to listen. Where today, eh, I don't know, gospel, schmospel, who needs it? I'm getting along just fine. Not in that period. They're not going to be getting along just fine. Third reason for the tribulation is the Jews, and it's the most important reason. The tribulation will at long last break the back of Judaism. The Jews are very proud of their ability to persist, to overcome any obstacle. And of course, in the last 3,000 years, they've met obstacle after obstacle. Nation after nation has tried to destroy them. They have not been destroyed, and they have developed a kind of pride saying, we don't need God. We're God's chosen people. And since he chose us, we'll get along just fine. Thank you very much. And as to where God actually is, we don't know. But we'll find out in due time. They're very, very cavalier when it comes to their God concept. With one exception, and that is they say, we are God's chosen people. Well, that attitude's got to be broken. The attitude that they are God's chosen people has got to stop being their fundamental credo. Instead, they have to reach a point that we all reach, which is, Lord, I am unworthy. I am unworthy of your grace, and do with me what you will. They haven't reached that point yet as a nation at all. In fact, quite the opposite. They're very proud of themselves. Those are the three reasons for the tribulation. To go back and review a little bit, we were in Revelation chapter 12 two weeks ago, talking about the woman. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. I mentioned that J.A. Seiss and E.W. Bullinger both wrote books back in the late 19th century having to do with the gospel in the stars. And both Seiss and Bullinger, I think, really very well documented the fact that the zodiac as it came to be known in Babylon and Egypt and in Greece, the Zodiac originally started out to tell the story of God's creation of the world and his ultimate redemption of this world. But it became perverted. And both Seiss and Bullinger said that in reality, Virgo, the sign of the Virgin, should be the first sign of the Zodiac because it tells the story of redemption. 
And of course, you have woven all the way through the celestial zodiac the sign of the great dragon, Draco. But right together in the zodiac, you have Leo the lion and Virgo the virgin. And they float through the plane of the solar ecliptic so that the sun is in Virgo first, then in Leo, and it happens that the star Regulus, which is called the king star, appears in a paw of Leo the lion. And according to the ancient Persian interpretation of the zodiac, the star in the foot of Leo is the star that has to be right in the middle of all the activity when you interpret the pattern of the heavens. And they said that this lion was the king and that right next to him was the picture of the woman, the virgin. And if you look in the celestial zodiac, you do see those signs close together. Those signs begin a procession through the heavens that tells the story of redemption. And I think that John here is relating his vision through the zodiac as it was originally thought to be interpreted. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, or a sign, samayon, a sign. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And of course, you know, going all the way back to Joseph, who had the dream, that the stars are the tribes of Israel, the twelve tribes. Upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Those twelve stars ultimately will play into the construction of the new Jerusalem. She being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, that is another sign in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon. Well, the great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, is the sign of Draco, which is different from the other signs in the zodiac in that it encircles the entire zodiac above the plane of the ecliptic. It's just sort of everywhere. And Draco the dragon, of course, is a picture of Satan. And he is red. And red, of course, is the sign of war and destruction. He has seven heads and ten horns, and we're going to be talking about the seven heads and ten horns today, and the seven crowns that he has upon his head. Because those heads, horns, and crowns represent the factions in this world that are dead set on eliminating Christianity. Have you noticed, as I have, that there is a growing bias, a global bias against Christianity? You just see little bits and pieces of it more and more and more. You see an anti-Christian bias making itself known. And I think it's going to happen so quickly it'll make your head swim. Like the young man in Norway who went out and killed a bunch of people was instantly branded a Christian. He's called a Christian, and he was out killing Muslims in the name of Jesus. And he was interpreted in the news as being the next threat, Christian terrorism. This growing bias against Christianity is the work of Draco the dragon, and ultimately the work of the seven heads and ten hordes. There is a I guess a conspiracy would be a good word. I don't like to use the word conspiracy. Because more than a conspiracy, it's a plan, a long, ancient plan to disenfranchise God's redemptive pattern. And that's the work of Draco the dragon. So you have the dragon standing before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and in her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. The woman has to flee into the wilderness for the final three and a half years of the tribulation period. The woman, of course, is Israel, but more than Israel, as a matter of fact more than Israel. The woman is representative of something vast, something huge. I think something that is so big that we really can't comprehend it all. You've heard me talk about the riddle before, and I'm going to do it again. I'm going to tell you a riddle. I'm thinking of someone in history. 
He left his indelible print upon mankind. Without a biological miracle on the womb of his mother, his birth would have been impossible. That's number one. Number two, he was taken to Egypt to preserve his life. Number three, as an infant, he was called the Son of God. I'm thinking of someone here, and I'm just naming points about his life. Number four, he returned to the land of Israel, hated by everyone, despised, rejected of man, man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. Number five, he was hated so greatly that he was executed by the Romans. Number six, on the third day he came out of his tomb. And number seven, he will never die again. Finally, number eight, he will bless the entire world upon his return. So who am I thinking of? And many of you who have heard me say this before know who I'm talking about. Israel. You might have thought I was talking about Jesus. I was talking about Israel. And all of these points are true of Israel. Israel was born through a biological miracle on the womb of Sarah. Israel was taken into Egypt to protect his life. In Egypt, God through Moses called Israel his son. Israel, you are my son. So he was called the son of God. He returned to Israel where he was hated by the Canaanites and the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, Syrians, the Romans, the Seleucids. They all hated Israel. Israel was hated so greatly that He was finally executed by the Romans in 70 A.D. But at the third day, Israel will come out of the tomb and be born again or resurrected. Well, I think we've seen that already, 1948, but going back to 1897. And according to prophecy, Israel will never die again. What am I saying here? Israel and Jesus are one and the same phenomenon. And a lot of people want to push Israel aside and say, Israel is all gone. Israel is just out of the picture. In fact, I meet Christians all the time, and I have to take them from step one and say, God has not forever set Israel aside. And I have to start at that level and explain why Israel is important in the world today. A lot of people, and you may already have experienced this, a lot of people think that Israel is just a nuisance. If there just weren't any Israel over there in the Middle East, why, there would be peace. Israel's causing all this trouble. And that's the world's view. That was the world's view of Jesus, just a troublemaker. But Israel is back, and that's what's being spoken of here. There is a wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. That could be said to be the Virgin Mary, giving birth to the man-child, but it's also Israel giving birth to the man-child. And the great red dragon hates Israel. great red dragon hated Jesus, too. But Jesus and Israel have parallel destinies. And the gospel of the kingdom will merge at a certain point when Jesus sets foot on the Mount of Olives and begins the process of reestablishing the throne of David. The man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, of course, came out of Israel. Israel blessed the world. Paul says this in Romans. And at this point in time, I'll read Romans 11, 11, and 12. Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall, speaking of Israel? And then he says, as Paul always says, meganoito, which is a Greek way of saying, Ain't no way. God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Verse 12, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, the diminishing of the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. And then he goes on to say in verse 15 of chapter 11 in Romans, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, What shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Did you get that? The receiving of Israel is going to be resurrection. Well, that's what we have in Revelation 12, a resurrection of Israel. 
Meanwhile, the world out there and most of the denominations in the world, most of the Christian denominations, have a replacement theology. The European schools of Christianity, the Roman school of Christianity, the Orthodox school of Christianity, all of those say that Israel's been forever set aside. The church has taken Israel's place, and you can just forget about Israel. Israel's is nothing but a great troublemaker. By the way, they have woven that into their central elements, their church doctrines. In many cases, refusing, as has the United Presbyterian and Episcopalian churches, refusing to give aid or support or recognition to any group in any way associated with national Israel. For if the casting away of them, that is, Israel, be the reconciling of the world, the casting away of Israel is the reconciling of the world. Just think about those words. The casting away of Israel is the reconciling of the world. Remember, it's one of my favorite words in the Bible, to reconcile. The Greek verb is apokatalasso, which means to change something into something else, to totally alter something forever. The casting away of Israel is the reconciling of the world. God used that in 135 AD when Simeon bar Kokhba and his group lost their last battle to the Romans and the Jews were chased to the four corners of the world and persecuted and tortured to this very day. That was the reconciling of the world. That'll make you think, won't it? If you're like me, it'll make you think. Why did God choose that method? Well, he's God. He doesn't think like men. He has a higher motive and purpose. And so we go back to Revelation 12. We have the wonder in heaven, the woman, who is also the man. She brings forth a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. She flees into the wilderness at this time point in time, that is in the middle of the tribulation, Israel carefully and patiently regathered from all the nations of the world as she is being regathered even as we speak. And by the way, the rate of immigration into Israel of Jews from all over the world is increasing, not decreasing right now. And yet after all this work to bring the Jews from the four corners of the world, Israel is going to have to flee the land. And there was war in heaven, verse 7. By the way, when the woman gives birth, it will be as though, according to Jeremiah, men, not women, are laboring to give birth. And Jeremiah had a vision of that. And he said, this is a vision I can't understand. This is crazy. Men laboring in childbirth. How can this possibly be, says Jeremiah? Well, we know how it can be. 12.7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Now, there is this war in heaven at that time. Right now we're talking about the middle of the tribulation period, and the war quickens at this point. But I have to tell you that the war between Michael and Satan has been going on for thousands of years. Daniel talks about it. You get hints of it in the Minor Prophets, You get hints of it in 1st and 2nd Chronicles. All through the Bible, it talks about this war in heaven that's been going on. There are good angels and bad angels. They have territorial prescriptive rights of various kinds and protocols. They're constantly battling in the heavens, as they have been doing for as long as we can think of planet Earth. And Michael is the angel who stands for God's redeemed, in particular Israel. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Daniel talked about Michael. When Daniel prayed and the angel of the Lord came to him, the angel of the Lord said, you know, I had trouble getting here because I was opposed by the dark forces. But Michael, one of the chief princes, that is the archons, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So you have just outright statements of the fact that heaven is not a wonderful, peaceful place, so we might think of it. 
but the atmospheric heavens and just beyond the dimensional veil, there is a constant battle being fought 24-7. We are on a rebel world where there have been rebel forces fighting for as long as anybody can remember. We are on a battlefield planet. You might even call this a prison planet. This prison planet, if you will, is awaiting a redemption. And we're part of that. And we were made part of it for a reason. We were put here not only because we were born in sin and deserve it, but because we are to become part of the redemptive factor. That is, we are converted, we are given the new birth, we are brought into the forces of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we become part of the armies of heaven. And one of these days, when he comes back at his second coming, we're going to accompany him, and it's going to be a glorious day. We're going to be part of the armies of heaven. What a privilege to have been born into this dark place and to have become part of the battle. And I must say, a battle that our Lord is going to win. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Now this is something new. The eighth verse here in chapter 12 in Revelation is brand new. All the way through the Bible, Satan has total access to the heavens. He's called the prince of the power of the air. In the book of Job, he and the Lord have a discussion. The Lord says, where have you been, Satan? And Satan says, well, I've been looking over my property, been walking up and down to and fro and, and uh, just checking things out. Well, if you're a property owner, you do that. And he owns the whole world, and he feels pretty confident that he's got the free run of the place and has had for I don't know how long. That's a subject for discussion. But at this point in time, that is at the middle of the tribulation, at the same time the Antichrist has stood up and proclaimed himself to be God, and we'll talk about that a little more later, at that very time, the great red dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now you don't want to be on the surface of the earth. We've already read Revelation 9, where the key was given to an angel who opened the well shaft of the abyss, the bottomless pit, and let all those imprisoned demons and fallen angels out. But now, in addition to that, we have the dark angels of heaven and Satan being released on the face of the earth, and no longer will they be able to hide behind a dimensional veil. I think they're going to be right out in the open and visible. It'll be a horrible time to be alive, unimaginable. Science fiction at its worst. And I think sci-fi, there is something, and I've said this so many times, in the urge to write bigger and better and more dramatic science fiction, man is looking inside himself and sort of seeing the fulfillment of all those things that have been prophesied. It's just going to be horrible on the face of the earth. Again, I take this to be reality, not a spiritualized doctrine of some symbolic this or some symbolic that. I believe there really is a real red dragon. And if he landed somewhere, you could walk up and touch him. I mean, he's real. All of these things are real. The serpent, of course, the dragon, was allowed to corrupt the human genome. And the battle given in Genesis 3.15 has been a battle to preserve the human genome. It'll be the battle of your seed, the dragon, against her seed, the woman. The battle is to preserve the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman, of course, being the Lord Jesus Christ, but also the seed of the redeemed, as we find in Hebrews, and so we're right smack in the middle of a battle to preserve as much of humanity as possible, lest the forces of the old serpent corrupt humanity once again, as they did before the flood. Verse 10, And I heard a loud voice in heaven, saying, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. That's going to change everything. Job 
the book of Job is all about the accuser of the brethren. The story of Job is a story of precisely how Satan accuses the redeemed. It gives all the details. And Job is just one man out of millions of people who are similarly accused. But at this point in time, the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. This is a battle to the death. In other words, real people doing real battle and dying real deaths here during the tribulation period. A time when the supernatural becomes the natural. A time when one man stands up and calls fire down from heaven and says, I'm God, and people believe him. It's a time when the two witnesses are on the earth doing miracles, withholding the rain and turning the waters to blood. A time when natural law is suspended. And a time when all the stops are pulled out in order to win the final battle. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. And therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down to you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. How long does he have? Well, assuming that he's defeated by Michael in the middle of the tribulation, that will start the clock ticking for the second half of the tribulation, 1,260 days plus some reconciling days that are given by Daniel. But a very short time, three and a half to four years, Satan has. And that's all he has. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you. Can you imagine living? And by the way, there will be a number, I don't know what number, a large number of redeemed living in the time of the tribulation. And they're going to be living under the most amazingly dramatic setting you can possibly imagine. And they will be tossed to and fro by news from here and news from there and Satan falling out of the air. And this woe in Revelation 12, 12, is not just an idle woe. Every time you see a woe in Revelation, it means this is the next bad thing, a really bad thing. This woe is when the devil comes down and he has great wrath. He has but a short time. I think that short time is about 1,260 days, and he's going to try to do all the evil he can possibly do in that short time. I wouldn't want to be on earth at that time. I just wouldn't. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. The woman would be Israel, of course. And his persecution of the woman results in God's interceding to save the woman. And we've talked about this before, but I wanted to mention again in verse 14, to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. So serpent's down on earth now. He's been cast out of heaven. He's a visible presence on earth. Can you imagine a great red dragon flying over about noon and you just see it going from one side of the sky to the other side? You know, I wonder where he's going and I don't want to be where it is. So I just take these things literally because the dragon is now, let me read this again, he sees, verse 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth. It's like, whoa, he looks at himself and says, man, I've lost my shielding. They can see me. Boom, I'm on the ground. Everybody knows it's me. But that doesn't stop him. He's still very, very busy. He's still marshalling the forces of the dark side. 
he especially goes after the woman, that is Israel, because the woman is the key to the reconciliation of this planet, just as Paul said. Remember, Paul said the falling or the casting away of Israel is the reconciling of the world. Why wouldn't Satan want to just wipe them out completely and thereby forego the reconciliation of this world, which means the coming of Christ to rule upon the throne of David? So the woman receives two wings of great eagle. Now, it's not the U.S. Air Force. It's not the Israeli Air Force or any other Air Force. It's God who is depicted throughout Scripture as having eagle's wings. Exodus 19, verse 4 says, Through Moses to the tribes of Israel, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagle's wings, and brought you unto myself. So God refers to the Exodus as bearing Israel on eagle's wings to save them. And we find verse, I could read a lot of verses similar to that. I think the metaphor of eagles' wings is simply a metaphor of physical salvation for Israel. Israel is taken somewhere into her place in the wilderness. Now, a lot of people have said it's Petra. We went through this before, and I'm kind of semi-reviewing a lot of what I said the last time, plus adding some detail a lot of people have said that this hiding place is Petra or Bozrah, as Isaiah says. Maybe. God could supernaturally place Israel inside of some unknown cavern. I don't know. And of course, the key is that nobody knows. If you said you knew the place where God was going to hide Israel, you'd have to be sworn to secrecy. Wouldn't be a secret anymore. But there she is nourished for three and a half years and preserved from the face of the serpent. This tells us that the red dragon, the serpent, whose dimensional garb has been stripped away and now he's on planet Earth, is going after Israel for three and a half years. He's on the ground. Well, I think he can fly, but he cannot fly beyond the dimensional veil as is now possible for him. He's stuck here on planet Earth. And the woman is hidden, but the serpent causes some kind of a flood. The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood, suggesting that Israel is hidden in some low place and that Satan, the serpent, reasons that if he can channel water into that low place, he can drown Israel out. Hosea 5.9 says, Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke, that is the tribulation. Among the tribes of Israel have I made known that which will surely be. Hosea 5.10, the princes of Judah were like them that remove the bound. In other words, they were behaving badly. Therefore, says God, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. And he's talking about the tribulation period when he pours out his wrath. In other words, he allows Israel to be the subject of some kind of a flood, a supernatural flood, I suppose. But the earth helps the woman. The earth opens her mouth and swallows up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Of course he is, because remember Genesis 3.15? where God said to Adam and Eve, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He's been mad at her ever since. The woman is the seed that brought forth the Messiah, but more than that, it is all of those who are redeemed by the seed of the woman. That is, we are part of, as the body of Christ, we are part of that seed. And Satan is angry with us, too. His battle is to destroy the seed of redemption. And he'll try it until the very last possible moment to do that. The dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What's happened now to Israel? Israel has been taken out of the land. Israel has been the subject of the wrath of the fallen serpent. 
And God sees this persecution and he carries Israel out of the land into some kind of a hiding place elsewhere. So now Israel is not in Israel anymore, which is really strange because we think of Israel as having come back right now to the land and that Israel will never again be ejected from the land. That is not true. Israel is going to be ejected from the land at the middle of the tribulation period. In fact, Isaiah refers to this in chapter 11 of Isaiah, verses 9 through 12. Listen to this. Isaiah is talking about Israel in the latter day. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. That's the way he starts this prophecy. And in that day, now when Isaiah says in that day, he's talking about the day of the Lord. There shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So Isaiah here is talking about the setting up of the kingdom at the second coming of Christ. But the next verse says, and it shall come to pass in that day. And that day is when the throne of David is reestablished in Israel. That the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of the people. So here at the end of the tribulation, you have Isaiah prophesying, the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. So there's going to be a second international regathering of the Jews. Now, the first international regathering of the Jews began in 1897. Or if you want to be detailed and strict about 1892. But that was the first international regathering. The second international regathering of Israel will be at the end of the tribulation. The second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Well, the islands of the sea in Hebrew are yam Iyim, the continents, which is translated into King James here as islands of the sea. But what Isaiah is saying is this. In this second international regathering, you go out sort of like in concentric rings. The first ring will be Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam and then from Shinar and Hamath, and then finally from the islands of the sea. All the continents in the world. That's where the second international regathering will come from. And it will be necessary because Israel had to be hidden from the dragon. Verse 17, right at the end of Revelation 12, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They both keep the commandments and have the testimony. So these are Hebrew Christians, if you will, or Messianic Jews, because it says they keep the commandments and have the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. These Messianic Jews are being prepared at this point for the second coming of Christ. At the same time, as all this is going on, we have the Antichrist doing all that he is doing. We've talked about that three weeks ago. The Antichrist is going through a number of his own battles at this time. He's waging battles against competing forces until he finally consolidates his own. And this consolidation is shown in Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the beast out of the sea 
is a composite beast, the identity of this beast can be discovered in Daniel chapter 7, where the lion is Babylon. The leopard is Greece. The bear is Medo-Persia. In other words, this composite beast is comprised of the offspring of the great kingdoms which arose in the days before Christ. And we know from Daniel's prophecy that the fourth beast is going to rise and dominate all of the other beasts. Now, what is the fourth beast? The fourth beast is an indescribable beast. When Daniel saw him, he wasn't even able to give a full description of the beast because it was so bizarre and it was different from all the other beasts, said Daniel. Well, I think John actually sees the beast here, which is a serpent rising up out of the sea. And the sea would be the sea of humanity. In the Bible, where the sea is used as a symbol, it always typifies the masses of the people. Humanity on the earth is described as a roiling sea, the sea of the nations and so forth. So you have here a dragon-powered beast with the elements of all of the nations that went before it. One point in closing, and we're going to really get into the details of this next week. One point that you want to remember from Daniel, and I'm turning back there right now, is this. When Daniel talks about the fourth beast, which is what John is describing there in Revelation 13, in Daniel 7.7, 7, he says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. The thing I want to note there, and we're going to really get into detail about this next week, is the word diverse in chapter 7, verse 7 of Daniel. It was diverse from all the beasts that went before it. The beasts that went before this beast are the Babylonian lion, the Medo-Persian bear, the Greek leopard, and the fourth beast, Rome and the revived Roman Empire. What was different about Rome from all of the other empires that went before it. And this is very important because it shows up in Bible prophecy. Rome was an imperial power, and Rome was the first imperial power. Babylon was not an imperial power. Medo-Persia, not an imperial power. Greece was not an imperial power. And by imperial, I mean bureaucratic. The Romans were very successful at controlling the world where the foregoing nations had not been able to really pull it off. Alexander the Great in 323 BC conquered the whole world and he wept because he had no more worlds to conquer. But in just a very few years after that, the Greeks lost most of the control that Alexander had gained. Why? Because they were not an imperial power. An imperial power understands how to delegate authority and set up procurates around in the various parts of the world that they have captured. And so their designated imperial forces set up little governments all over the land. They know how to delegate authority to regions. Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece didn't do that, but the Romans did. They were imperial in the way they set up their government. And you could say that, in a way, the imperial governments that Rome set up in the days of Jesus' first coming are still there today. They're highly modified, but the imperial powers grew into monarchies that still exist to this very day. That is the way that the fourth beast is diverse from all the other beasts that go before it. And it's very important to understand this imperial concept because when you understand that, you can understand the ten horns, which are delegated imperial powers or procurates that eventually control the whole world. And we're going to get into that in depth and detail the next time. But why is it important to study all this? I think it's important because 
bit by bit and piece by piece, you sort of get a little vision of the little elements that are now falling into place in preparation for the rising of this global power, which will be an imperial power. An imperial power will start out with ten horns. There will be a little horn that rises, knocks off three of the delegated imperial powers, and becomes the new seventh imperial power, and at the height of his power, he is killed, murdered. And he is actually dead, as we're going to see next week, and he actually rises from the dead. And the whole world wonders after this seventh horn who rises from the dead and is given power, such power that people actually believe him when he says, I am God. This is after his resurrection. Why is it important to study all this? It's the grandeur. It's, it's, Revelation is one of the very few places in the Bible where we're sort of given the inside track on what God is doing and is going to do. And God's glory shines through this book in an amazing way.